throughout history, relying on the power of soldiers and brave warriors has been one of the most utilized ways to provide both safety and growth for one's people. Give them nothing, but take from them everything! This effort has taken many forms since the occasions, means, and needs of various groups were quite different throughout history. Today, we take a look at some of the deadliest and most fear-inducing soldiers. The Aztec Eagle Warriors. Being one of the most iconic infantry, Eagle Warriors, or as some call them, Eagle Knights, had to be a part of this list. Besides their frightening appearance, what may stand out right from the start is their battle tactic, which was strongly affected by the culture and the religious rituals. The weird thing about being the Eagle Warrior's opponent is that this overwhelming force was primarily focused on taking prisoners as a part of the religious practices. To join these elite units, a soldier not only had to undergo rigorous training and prove himself the most capable, but also had to be either of noble birth or have achieved great success on the battlefield. This is where we can notice how seriously Aztecs approached to proper talent selection. Even back then, stats of a sort were taken into account. In the case of Eagle Warriors, this even included the number of prisoners taken in battle. As mentioned, battle prisoners were important for religious reasons. This is why the merit of achieving impressive numbers of these was rewarded by the honor of being included in this elite unit. By not including only those of noble origin, but instead opening eagles to commoners who had proven themselves, the Aztecs successfully created some of the most feared soldiers. With no exceptions based on their status in society, Aztec boys were trained and educated about weaponry and warfare. This was considered a basic education back then, as battle capability was an important resource. Up until the age of 14, boys were educated by their parents. It was considered the parents' responsibility to procure battle-capable children, and their progress was monitored by society. Occasionally, even a form of evaluation and tracking of the progress was done in the local temples. As a sign that a boy has become a man, they had to be tested, and the test was capturing their first prisoner. When it comes to the equipment they used, this fearsome elite group of warriors relied on Makwahuitl, a wooden club embedded with obsidian blades. This weapon was used among Mesoamerican civilizations between 900 BC and 1570 AD. With its length being somewhere between 35 and 47 inches or 90 to 120 centimeters and its weight up to 6.6 .6 pounds or 3 kilograms, we can imagine how devastating and incapacitating blows it could provide. In accordance with their name, they wore heads of eagles on their heads. Bearing such a crown, they were revered in their social life as well. For their service and achievements, Eagle warriors were considered nobility, and their temple, which they used as headquarters, was right next to the ruler's palace. The Roman Legionary If you have watched the adventures of Asterix and Obelix, you may remember the interesting square-shaped formation their Roman adversaries used to employ. We will now see that they aren't truly as easily beaten as cartoon heroes may have made it seem. To briefly describe this interesting sight, we can imagine soldiers standing shoulder to shoulder in a square-like formation, holding their shields in front of them and above them to protect each person from arrows and other projectiles that may target them. This iconic battle tactic is known as the Testudo Formation, and Romans utilized it in various capacities. This amazing formation's name translates to turtle, as we will keep addressing it. We can easily see how the turtle formation communicates the analogy with its appearance. If we had a chance to peek below all these firm shields, we could find that turtle formations mostly consisted of legionaries, heavy Roman infantry soldiers. Even though it may be daring, the Roman Empire owes much of its military success to this essential type of soldier. Primarily recruited from Roman Italy, legionaries were mobilized 
from Roman citizens. All battle-capable males were considered as long as they were under 45 years old. The Roman soldier hierarchy is one of the best organized army systems recorded in history. We can notice how advanced the system was, even from how many different groups there were. Based on their capabilities and strengths, cohorts were formed to mark troops that were considered weak or new to the role, those of normal competence and those that excelled as legionaries. As we will see, the strength of this type of soldier is based on discipline, which is applied through systematic battle tactics. To become a true contributing legionnaire, they had to build strength. Swimming, gymnastics and long marches under heavy equipment are the starting points, after which comes training to poke enemies with a spear while covering one's weak points with a shield. The preciseness of military principles can be recognized even through the equipment legionaries used to achieve these amazing feats. They had standard equipment that weighed about 60 pounds or 27 kilograms. Besides the armor, sword and a throwing spear, their large shield and a heavy spear were necessary for turtle formation. The outcome of such preparation was that a standard requirement for a Roman legionnaire was to be able to march approximately 22 miles or 35 kilometers in five hours while carrying full equipment. Such strength was then supported further by education in battle tactics and formations. While legionaries were primarily an armed force, they were also relied on as a workforce. Besides developing the Roman infrastructure, they also served as a sort of police force, keeping the provinces safe and sound. After being subjected to military training and taught how to become a part of this large organization, the legionaries would begin their 25-year-long career. Spartan Hoplites Spartan Hoplites were soldiers who were taught to rely on their shields and spears to protect their comrades in the most dire of situations. In the case of Hoplites, the formation they relied on is called Phalanx. In ancient Greece, soldiers were mostly free citizens, meaning that they made their living through farming or various types of crafting. In some places, only a smaller group of warriors existed whose primary calling was being soldiers. This, however, wasn't the case in Sparta. Free citizens of Sparta were strongly devoted to battle capability. The military service of Spartans started early and their training never ceased. Placing such a fierce focus on developing military capabilities made the rest of the society develop around such values. This made Sparta the home of one of the most professional armies of its time. To understand how this came to be, we take a look at the Spartan Agog, the system of education and training of young men. Even though it was quite extreme, it was aimed at developing strength and endurance in hoplites. It also had an important mission to firmly establish the importance and understanding of solidarity. Harsh selection and assessment of a potential to become a true Spartan soldier began soon after the male infant was born. Once they turn seven, boys are grouped into companies that provide a setting for all of them to learn and train, essentially living together. As a part of this tough upbringing of soldiers, they are tested and toughened up by scarce clothing and even being barefoot, regardless of the weather conditions. Calling the Spartan training system a lifelong one wouldn't be much of an exaggeration. The exercise regime made sure hoplites stayed fit throughout their whole careers. For some, this wasn't until they turned 60. Hoplites had their personal equipment with which they protected their lives and the lives of their comrades. This equipment included a nearly eight foot or two, five meter long spear whose both ends could be used for battle since they were sharp. The shield Spartans used was quite a heavy one and who would be surprised considering it was designed to stop whatever force came rushing from the other side. Being large enough to cover a soldier from chin to knee, it weighed between 18 and 33 pounds. Interestingly enough, for hoplites, the sword was a secondary weapon. 
it was usually used if their spears broke. As mentioned, Spartans found strength and endurance to be necessary, but solidarity is important as well. Spartans' phalanx military formation is the pinnacle of this value. It represents the result of training with the purpose of becoming one during battle. To take the perspective of someone charging toward one of these deadly formations, what we would first be met with is a line of spears. These are pushed forward by the first few ranks, presenting the first line of defense. Behind these spears, there is a line of steadily locked together shields of the first row of soldiers. By applying such a style of combat, even those in the back, beyond the first line of soldiers, are able to engage actively. To keep their formation firm, the soldiers in phalanx would move steadily toward their enemies, and some theories suggest that they relied on the group's strength to push enemies forward as the shields and spears of the first few lines of soldiers in the formation were bashing them. Italian Arditi Moving on to a more recent history and more advanced military tactics, we find ourselves looking into Arditi, an elite Italian shock unit that became known as the Most Feared Corps. The craziness of this unit is hidden even in its name as Arditi could be translated to the Daring Ones. Besides being one of the first modern shock troops, their brave combat style showed that this elite special force of World War I was indeed named aptly. This group used the element of surprise as their greatest advantage. In the confusion that followed their appearance, they were able to achieve many victories relying solely on grenades and knives. To put things in perspective, they relied on these wits and bravery against enemies using all types of weapons, including machine guns. Simply put, they brought knives into a gunfight and did so with miraculous success. Even though shock units are usually there to do exactly as the name suggests, to shock the enemy before the main infantry enters the scene, the Arditi weren't seen as a part of any infantry. Instead, they have created space for themselves to be praised and considered as an entirely separate unit. The tactic that this brave group utilized was to get near enemy trenches under the cover of an artillery barrage. Naturally, this would make the enemies in the trench take cover and often stay ignorant of the nearing Arditi. The artillery fire would stop as they would get close to their goal, but they would make up for the noise by throwing their grenades close to the trench. In this way, their unsuspecting enemies would be thrown off by the sudden appearance of Arditi. Juramentado. The Philippine-American War was surrounded by spooky stories of warriors that don't go down even when being shot. The American soldiers who had managed to take the islands from the Spanish army were faced with an unbelievable enemy. The Moro tribes caused the fear that turned the soldiers' blood to ice. The warriors of the tribe, Juramentados, have shown that they certainly aren't the ones to back away from a fight, even when their only weapon against an army is a dagger. They used especially frightening-looking blades called Chris daggers, but they are also known to have relied on spears and projectiles, in the form of arrows. Occasionally, they also used muskets. Imagine the fear that an American soldier would face when, even though armed with a revolver, he can't seem to bring down one of these demon-like warriors who have knives. We could say that the Juramentados had a trick up their sluee. The rituals they performed before engaging in combat included wrapping their bodies tightly with strips of cloth. In this way, they were able to slow down the loss of blood that wounds would cause. Furthermore, by including drugs in such a ritual, they were able to inhibit the sensation of pain that various wounds may cause. Combined together, the effects of these preparation rituals have turned the Moro tribe's warriors into berserkers of a sort. Zulu warriors some of the greatest soldiers to have walked the plains of Africa 
were the mighty Zulu warriors. United under the rule of the praised and respected King Shaka, the Zulu people have become one of the strongest military forces in the early 19th century. Through their might, they were able to gather the neighboring tribes and form one of the greatest threats and obstacles to European colonization of Africa. In this way, a seemingly insignificant and unorganized tribe, counting members in thousands, turned through time into a kingdom of five zero 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 warriors. King Shaka wasn't only a man with a vision, but a plan as well. He was a thinker who had military improvements in mind as he introduced various military tactics to his people. Besides helping organize soldiers and creating a system that resembled a military one, he worked on discipline, training, and changing the weapons his warriors used. He started by placing young men in age-appropriate regiments called impis. In such a regimen, men would live and train together and even wear similar feathers and furs to show their belonging. In this way, even a competition was established between the impis, which wasn't frowned upon if it didn't include the use of lethal weapons, such as spears. Further adjusting the system, older and more knowledgeable Zulu warriors were put in command of such regiments. This way, the experience is mixed with youth and the strength it brings. Even this slight adjustment was enough to stir up some organization among the Zulu ranks, which was successful enough to echo throughout history. Shaka is known for making another important change. Instead of the previously used long spears called Asagai, he has introduced the shorter ones named Iklawa. These spears were better suited for close combat and proved to be just the adjustment his tribesmen needed to become more fearful. Berserkers As one of the most iconic types of soldiers that have made a mark in medieval history, berserkers are even quite a common character class in many modern video games. Thanks to the amazing stories and feats these warriors were able to pull off, they are a part of this list. Setting their humanity aside for the sake of battle, berserkers were the cause of fear not only to the overwhelmed enemies, but also to their own troops. It would be appropriate to imagine them as an embodiment of danger and animalistic rage. To actually invoke such a beastly and fearless rush of strength, rituals were set in place in preparation for battle. In these rituals, dances, animal skins, and maybe even mushrooms were utilized to reach the complex states that berserkers were set in. This combination of factors was what brought forward these uncontrollable warriors breaking through enemy ranks in various battles. The eagerness of berserkers to go into battle was said to have been such that they resorted to biting their own shields so as not to rush out too early. While the backstory of berserkers may not seem to have the potential for strategic advantages, a battle that took place in 1066 AD would suggest otherwise. As we will see, berserkers can turn out to be not just a way to rush enemies, but also a wild card that leaves enemies frightened and unable to advance. In the Battle of Stamford Bridge, outnumbered by the Saxon force, the Viking army was made to retreat across a bridge. Since the Saxon army was just a step behind, the chances of this retreat being successful were quite low. However, it was at that moment that a berserker took a stand in the middle of the bridge. Shinsengumi Moving from the wild cards that berserkers may be to a group renowned as composed and well thought through, we come to a legendary special police force from Japan. During the late Edo period in Kyoto, this elite group of swordsmen was founded to protect the shogunate in an uneasy period. Namely, at the time, the idea of foreign culture entering the country through trade and similar activities was quite a controversial one. Even though one could expect modernization to be a good thing, not everyone thought that way at the time. As the opening of Japan to trade was taking place, the need for peacekeeping and policing within the country grew. Out of this need, 
a group of 234 ronin, or samurai who had no master, were hired to protect Kyoto from forces opposing the idea. Kondo Isami, a skilled swordsman and an experienced military man, was the head of this newly formed police force. Being populated by members drawn from various sword schools of Edo, promising amazing skills, and led by a wise strategist, Shinsengumi quickly made a name for themselves. The loyalty and duty characters that could be found on their flag were indeed attributed to these fearless law keepers. While Shinsengumi achieved many feats, one of the battles that gave it an unquestioned reputation was the Ikedaya incident. Namely, a group of rebels planned to attack the city, but was swiftly stopped in an action that lasted under two hours. The Shinsengumi proved themselves to be more than just capable warriors. 95th Rifle Regiment In 1800, the idea of forming a corps of riflemen that would be able to shoot targets from long distances was introduced in the British Army. Scouts and sharpshooters were made a part of this group. It took three years for this regiment, initially named Experimental Corps of Riflemen, to become a well-established regiment called the 95th Regiment of Foot. This group of skilled shooters was able to accurately hit targets far beyond the reach of other soldiers. To use the famous Redcoats as a reference point, they were able to accurately shoot targets at about 230 feet, or 70 meters. For the 95th Regiment, this distance was much greater. This specially trained group of soldiers was able to keep their accuracy even with targets as far as nearly 600 feet or 180 meters away. In part, the members of the 95th Regiment were able to achieve such feats due to the special training that they went through. They utilized tactics that aren't unlike those that modern sniper shooters rely on. These included blending into one's surroundings and finding adequate cover to best support one's fighting style. Stealth was added to the list of this regiment's tactics and it made a significant change. Previously unreachable targets were now possible ones for the British Army. This newly reachable range was only in part due to special training that the 95th Regiment went through. Besides practicing their precision, it was supported by the Baker rifle. It had a grooved barrel and an adjustable sight, making accurate shots possible even at greater distances. Polish Winged Hussars We started this list with warriors who used the wings of an eagle as their symbols. As we near the end of the list, we will see another group of soldiers with similar ideas. The Winged Hussars were a Polish heavy cavalry unit. The wings on their backs were used as a way to induce fear in the enemies they were charging at. Considering how Hussars provided important victories from 1503 to 1702, they certainly did so. These wings were fastened either onto the armor of the soldier or the saddle of his horse. Even though it wasn't too common for the cavalry to be heavily equipped, Hussars operated wearing full body armor. Through time, even sturdier materials were used, and the armor spread onto the horse and saddle as well. Following the changes of time and advancement in weaponry, they were quite versatile when it came to the weapons they used. These ranged from lances and war hammers to pistols. To further outline how well adapted these soldiers were, we should mention that the horses they used were also specifically bred for the purpose of rushing at the enemies. They were trained and prepared to be fearless when facing troops and to have adequate stamina and speed necessary for effectively rushing through them. Interestingly enough, a death penalty would be issued if someone were to sell this special type of horse to an outsider. As one would expect from a heavily armed cavalry, Hussars employed the mounted charge as a battle tactic. They would head straight towards the enemy lines, starting at a somewhat slow pace and with a loose formation. As they neared the enemy, they would close ranks and adjust the pace so that its speed reached the peak just as the Hussars were slamming into the enemy lines. History has provided us with interesting records of various tactics, strategies and types of soldiers 
through which greater forces established their reign. The uniqueness of each one shows the creativity and thoughtfulness that went into developing such approaches. As we say our goodbyes, we invite you to think about which of these historical soldiers and their battle style you liked the most.